Yep. Okay, great. Uh, I'm Jeff Goldsmith, the publisher of Backstory. It's my absolute honor to introduce you to the co-writer of this fine film, Matt Aldrich, and the co-writer director, Adrian Molina. Well, so as promised, we got to start with the the important people in the room, the kids. We're gonna we're gonna do a round of uh, of kids questions. So, you know, make them make them relevant to the movie. Don't ask anything, but uh, <laughs> let's let's see some Coco questions. I see some kids in the front row. No question, no question. All right, all right. <laughs> what do we got? All right, right there, you sir. And I'll repeat the question after you say it. Are all the people of the Day of the Dead in the movie? Um, like every person who's ever died? <laughs> I, I think so. Adrian? Um, I, I think uh, in this film, this is the way that we were thinking about it, is, is th these would be all the people who would um, come to this region of the town that Miguel lives in. When he crosses the bridge uh, for the first time, you see that there's many different bridges that go to many different places. And we imagine that this land um, you know, there's a lot of people who are remembered and, and, and that, that um, the ones that Miguel kind of runs into, maybe, maybe they're more from, from the region where he's from. Good answer. Another kid's question. Oh, I see one right there in the middle. Speak up. Big voice. Excellent question. Did you guys play any of the characters in the movie? No, I did not. Um, I, I do have a small little cameo uh, when Miguel is in the... Uh, mausoleum, and he and he takes uh, Ernesto de la Cruz's guitar uh, from the tomb. Um, you hear a voice outside the window that says, "The guitar, it's gone." Ooh, Ooh that was spooky, <laughs> and it, it it sounds a lot like that. <laughs> I'm all creeped out. I feel like I just saw somebody. Uh, another kid's question: Are there any other kids left, or are they all asleep? All right, right there, right there, right there. Excellent question. When you were making the story, did you also think of what the visuals would be like? Yeah, yeah. I mean, uh, uh, the way it works uh, in the early stages is uh, uh, as you're coming up with ideas for the story, there are artists in the room uh, who are who are helping and uh, and generating um, paintings and and concept drawings and sourcing all kinds of images from you know, the, some of the, the, the photos that they would pull, I would say, where'd you get that? And they would say, the internet. And I would say, you, you have, must have your own internet, because I have never seen that picture before. Um, uh, and, and, uh, and so the visuals would inform the storytelling in sort of a positive way. You know, their ideas would give us ideas, our ideas would give them ideas, and, and that's how it sort of works in the early stages. Yeah, I started on this movie as a storyboard artist, and what their job is to do is get the script pages and then imagine what those words would look like as images. And, and so we're always trying to do both at the same time. And we'll talk about that more a little later. Uh, any other kids' questions or are all the kids in bed? Any other kids' questions? I'm just looking around to see because I don't want to leave anybody out. I'm seeing no. Do you have a question? Are you sure? All right, all right. Well, <laughs> thus concludes the kids' questions section of this uh, <laughs> seminar. Parents, you can take your kids home. Thanks, kids, so for all the questions. Um, I have, I have one kid's question for my daughter who wasn't able to make it tonight. Uh, she was curious why this didn't come out on Halloween. That is an interesting question. Um, well, one of the reasons is that um, we wanted very much to make uh, the distinction between Halloween and Dia de Muertos. Dia de Muertos is a celebration that takes place very close to the same time, but it actually doesn't have anything to do with Halloween. Um, in Mexico, we released this film a month earlier than it released in the United States, and because you know so much of uh, so many of the people uh, in Mexico uh, hold this tradition dearly, we wanted to get it out in theaters so that people could go with their families, so that they could experience the film um, close to the holiday. And in the United States, because this is so much a movie about your family. Um, experiences with your family. We thought that Thanksgiving was the perfect opportunity because then you can go with your grandparents, you can go with your parents, you can go with your aunts and uncles. And, and this is a film that we thought the experience is really enriched by watching it with people you love and people that you're close to.
Very good answer. Uh, first off, congrats in order. You guys won a Golden Globe for Thank Best you. Animated Movie. Thank you. Um, so some random journalists, uh, you know, made some decisions. Uh, that's the Golden Globes. But no, it, this movie deserves all the kudos it could get. I'll tell you, I'll tell you something else that I, that I thought was really cool, though, is, is that this movie, which, which showed a, a different story, a tale that's not often told in mainstream cinema, it made $192 million domestic, $398 worldwide, million dollars worldwide, <laughs> for a 590.9 million dollar cum, half a billion dollars. So I think that's a real achievement Thank you. in getting your story out there, a story unseen to, to broad audiences. And we're gonna talk about the making of this movie in a second, but I do wanna give people just a baseline for both of you. Um, Matt, we could start with you. Okay. Uh, I know you went to UCLA. I did. For yeah. theater and film. Yeah. And we have we're, Bruins. We're, we're Bruins. sitting. We're sitting here at the, the Los Angeles Film School. What, what did you get out of film school? That I didn't go to film school. I went to theater school. You went to theater school. I, I you yes, yes. I went yeah. to theater school. <laughs> Um, no, I, I, it's, it is the School of Film, Theater, and Television, but for, um, uh, there, there's, uh, there was, anyway, a, a, a pretty big firewall between the two um, uh, departments, and, and so I, I was exclusively in the theater school. Um, my emphasis was in playwriting, um, and uh, I didn't, when I, when I got out of film school, uh, or I should say when I got out of theater school with a theater degree in Los Angeles, uh, I had a hard time <laughs> making that work, and so in um, this theater town, you had a hard time. I know, I know. I so, so you know, so so um, I ended up uh, going to. I, I ended up getting a, a job in the film business. I worked uh, at the Sundance Institute, um, and so that was my With the screenwriting labs, right? Yeah, uh, uh, for a time uh, we were doing those labs in other countries for screenwriters in those countries, including uh, there was a, an annual lab in Oaxaca, Mexico. Um, uh, and, uh, and so my first job in the film business was traveling mostly throughout Latin America, uh, working with, um, uh, screenwriters there, filmmakers, going to, uh, taking, uh, uh, American independent screenwriters and filmmakers and bringing them there in sort of a cultural exchange, bringing films that had been at the Sundance Film Festival, uh, and showing them at the Havana Film Festival in December every year. Um, and so that was... That was my introduction to the film business, and those were the writers who I got to know in my early days when I was toying with the idea of writing movies instead of plays. Um, those were the writers who uh, gave me a bit of schooling of, of what the job was like. Not what the craft was like, but what the job was like. And, it, and that, uh, I got more out of those conversations than I, than I did it theater school. All right. That, that's, um, that's I got enough. other stuff at theater school, but, but the, but the, but the day to day, what the job is was, was, uh, was through these interactions. You wound up having a movie made in 2007. Yes. Cleaner. Yes. That was a spec. That was, ne that was, so for, for those, for, for that, w I wrote that I was the guy in the coffee shop. And so the, the, that, Normally doesn't ha like you, that. Normally doesn't go the distance when you sit down in a coffee shop to write something that you think is cool, and then after I think it was about four years of trying to get that made, we finally got it made in two thousand seven. And then you ended up on the blacklist, and to my knowledge, yes. that's with two screenplays. That was another coffee shop, right? Yeah. And that and that's how I think Pixar kind of you ended up on their radar, right? Yes, they read the I I, I was very lucky to be on the blacklist that year. I was on the blacklist the following year as well. Twenty eleven to twenty twelve. Yeah. Um, and the 2012 script was not the one that they read. It was the 2011 script. Father Daughter Time. Yes. Which Matt Damon was going to direct at one point. Yeah. So he, uh, he it, it was. It, I I had a very unique experience uh, uh, in that I wrote a spec. It was at a time when I was. Uh, it was kind of a. It was kind of a hail. <coughs> excuse me. It was a kind of a hail mary. Uh, at that point, uh, it was, I was, you know, uh, I was booking some work, but it, it was, it was really slow going. I was starting to think maybe the screenwriting thing isn't going to work out. Um, I was looking into, I was going to go, to, I was going to become a pastry chef. Um, and I said, well, before I do that, um, there's this one thing that I really want to write. And, uh, and so I wrote Father Daughter Time. 
and um, I remember my manager is in the in the room. Yeah, <laughs> he'll he'll remember this. Um, so I, I who's your manager? What's his name? He he he's the guy who's screaming. His name All is right. Jewel Jewel Ross. Nice. Um, and uh, he uh, he he uh, loved this uh, script that I wrote, and um, he got very excited about it. And we showed it to my agent at the time, and he didn't like it, and so we <laughs> fired him. And um, <laughs> and we we uh, signed with a new agent, and they created a, a kind of a, a one of those kind of storied bidding war uh, things. And and so Matt Matt got a hold of it thanks to that man over there, and. Um, uh, said he wanted to uh, direct it. He wanted that to be his, his directorial debut. What's the status of that? Jewel? <laughs> <laughs> no, no. I mean, it's, it, it, it's, we, it, we're, still, we're still trying to get it made all these years later. I mean, that's, that's the thing about this business is that it is nonlinear. It's stars have to align, literally. The stars have to align. Um, and, and you never quite know how it's all going to happen. Um, but the good news is, is that the script is still there. It's still, it's still part of, like, I still love it. Sure. It, it, it doesn't, you know, I, we're going to have to change the cell phone stuff eventually. But, um, but, you know, but you do that. That's an easy rewrite. The, the, the only Pixar, the first Pixar mention that I saw from you was, was a special thanks on Finding Dory. So did you do some, some script consulting on that? The, the so, first yeah. Uh, so I, I, I started on Coco in 2012. Um, and uh, within the f within that first year, uh, I, I moved uh, permanently to Oakland. I was living down here, um, but we moved to Oakland, um, and it, it, within about a year or so, um, the, the 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 way that uh, it's hard to describe without going to be basically there's there's two jobs that I have with with Pixar. One is uh, on a specific film, and one is sort of an open ended consulting job. Uh, and so I do consult on other projects, and I was, I didn't know I was going to be in the credits of that movie. I was really honored to find that out. Adrian, uh, you you didn't go to film school. You you actually went the total Disney path, to my knowledge. You went Cal Arts. I, I went to Cal Arts for character animation. Yes, um, I was there for three years, and then out of that, I uh, got an internship for story uh, boarding at at Pixar. And when I was at college, um, they kind of, at CalArts, they teach you a little bit of everything in, in terms of animation. So you do some actual animation, you do character design, you do storyboarding. And I found that storyboarding was something that really played to my strengths in that I'm, I'm, I got very invested in creating scenes, creating characters, um, uh, exploring through drawing. Um, dynamics of, of what does this character want, why is this character in their way, and it was a quick way to put uh, a story together quicker than, you know, frame by frame animation, and I wasn't a good enough drawer to do character <laughs> design, um, but, but, but um, storyboarding kind of allowed me to be the storyteller in the, the fastest way that you could with drawings. You, you went around through a lot of departments. You, you, you worked on the entitles of Ratatouille. You worked on the art department of Toy Story 3, on Monsters University. You were a story artist, and you were also um, additional screenplay material on Monsters U and on Good Dinosaur. Mm -hmm. So y it seems like Pixar really didn't pigeonhole you anywhere. No. W what's it like to be able to move around departments like that? Is that something that's very common at Pixar? It, it um, I, for me, it was really wonderful. I don't know how common it is, and I, do, I don't entirely know why I get to do it so much, besides <laughs> the fact that, um, that my policy has always been to, to provide a solution without asking permission to provide that solution. So, um, which, which I, I don't know where that comes from, except for the fact that I get really excited about things. So <laughs> when there is a spot in the story that um, feels like it needs some extra thinking and I've got the bandwidth to do it, I'll take it home, I'll write up notes, I'll do some drawings, I'll maybe I'll put together a little song um, uh, sketch to whatever it takes to, to say there is a moment that we can um, capitalize on from a story perspective in this film 
um, here's some ideas, here's some, some possible solutions. If you like them, run with them. If you don't like them, I just needed to get it out of my system. Um, and, and that has um, created a lot of really cool relationships between me and the directors I've worked with where, where they, can, they can say, oh, well, Adrian, why don't you put some brain power on this problem that we've had for a while? And, and those are the assignments that excite me and, and I get the freedom to be able to take it from a different angle and, and that's useful to someone who's trying to come up with a fresh solution. It's, it's interesting because you guys, I think, came on on different times for Coco as, as, yeah. as writers. Tell me about what the state of the project was when you came on, and both of you obviously were working with Lee Unkrit, the, the co-director of the film as well. But there was overlap. I mean, Adrian and I did work together. Right, right. Just when you were... When I was a story artist. You just right. started at different times. Yeah. Um, uh, so I started in, like I said, I started in 2012. I was working on this screenplay for three years in, in all its various iterations. Um, when I started... There was a uh, uh, there was a story that that doesn't bear much resemblance to the finished film. Um, that was the story that was pitched to me. Um, we sorry to interrupt, but what was the the biggest left turn that people would be surprised about? And I'm going to ask that a couple other times later. But the earliest earliest version is something that the earliest version that was pitched to me was um, I, I would just say that it 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 came from a very American point of view. Um, it had a lot of the same. It was still a little boy, and he goes to the, the land of the dead, et cetera. Um, uh, but the, uh, the the message of the film, um, for me, was running counter to what I was discovering in my research and 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 my own work uh, of what the holiday was all about. So uh, you've all seen the movie, and 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 the holiday is about remembering people. I mean, the holiday is about keeping keeping people close, and and um, from an American point of view, when someone in our family dies, I think the expectation is to grieve and then to, at some point, let them go, you know, like get closure. Like this is what sort of we're taught in this country and what, what um, you know, that, that, that we're supposed to move on somehow. And, um, and so that was, that was the, 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 the sort of the theme of, of the story as it was first pitched to me. And it just became very clear to all of us very sh quickly that was like, that's kind of not what the holiday is about. I mean, the holiday is about the exact opposite, that the way to healing, the sort of the deeper, more poetic solution to this problem is, is, is holding on, you know? It's keeping these people alive. And in fact, you have to because they are still present and they come back and they're, they're expecting. They depend on. They're depending the on you. Like, and in fact, if you forget them, they're dying another time. It was when we, when we found that nugget in our sort of a research of, of, of the second death as, as being part of the sort of the, the, the mythology of the, of the, of the holiday. The, the third death. The third the death. The final death. The final death, yes. This, there, is a, there is a second death. But yeah. Wait, tell us what's the second death and the third death. It's a little gr gruesome. The first death is oh, when you please. die. The second death is when the body goes in the ground, and the third death is when they forget about you. And so we just called it the final death because we didn't want to talk about bodies in the ground, because um, you know it's still a, it's still a family movie. Um, uh, but uh, that that idea of of dying a final death it solved so many. It's solved so many story problems. Like if everybody's dead, what's the worst that can happen? Right? Like, if you think about it, like, you're already dead. Like, y what's the worst that can happen to any of these characters? And then it's like, well, they can be forgotten. And it's like, oh, no, you know, like, d not that. Like, that seemed like a face fate worse than death. And so that, it was uncovering things like that that made us get excited about kind of wiping a lot of the w story away and starting from scratch and building, you know, what you see here. Adrian, at what point did you come on and, and, and end up assuming the roles of, of a co-writer and also a co-director? Um, I, I started on the film in 2013 as a story artist. I had worked with Lee and Darla on Toy Story 3 in that capacity. Um, it was probably, we've, I think we ultimately had eight screenings, uh, just intermediary screenings of this, eight to nine screenings of this film. Um, and after... I think our third screening, 
um, we were kind of shifting from a realm where this film was very much in a musical realm. Characters were singing about their feelings more than singing for the sake of performance. And we wanted to, we, we, we sat down, we talked about what was working, what wasn't working. And, um, and one of the things that, that we had put so much time into the research of the world, of, of, of the celebration, of the meaning behind all of it, and something about um, the musical aspect of it, in what we were building, um, I think we wanted to lean in a direction that allowed us to use more of the research, use more of the the influence of, of Mexican music, use more of the the performance based um, aspects of uh, of the world that Miguel lives in um, to build a film more like Oh Brother, more like Once in the way that music is used. And um, and I had the benefit as a story artist of seeing these three previous versions and, and knowing, oh, these are the things that we, we've liked all along. These are the things that we tried that maybe weren't the right direction, but have been pointing us in a good direction. And, um, and then I started um, writing, uh, I, I uh, emailed Lee, I said, I've been thinking about some of these story problems. I think this was after you had gone on to other things. Uh, I emailed Lee, I said, I know the things that, that you've always loved in this film. I've been thinking of the thorny spots where it's been difficult to figure out. And I've got, if you're willing to read, some pages that, um, that might be helpful. And now, now, at other studios, that could get people fired, by the way. Yeah. You know, <laughs> the, the guy that's not the writer sends in some script pages mm -hmm. and says, you know, you might want to look at it this way. So that's what I love about Pixar is, is that they, they're all about the idea, and it's, and it's a very egoless environment. Totally. And, and, you know, I also had to approach it from a standpoint. Um, I, I wanted to make it very easy for Lee and Darla to say, like, Thank you, but <laughs> like, 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 we appreciate your. Do you remember what you sent them? Do you remember what you were working on? Yeah, the very first um, piece I wrote because we were always trying to figure out how do you create stakes in this world. We knew of this idea of the uh, final death, uh, but we had never actually depicted it on screen. And and I I said I think there is a way that we can create a moment that one introduces this idea of Hector as a musician introduces the way that music can be given as a gift and then also um, introduces visually a character that you can fall in love with and then lose within the course of a scene. So I wrote um, that moment in Chicharron's shack where he's in the hammock. Um, uh, Hector realizes that he's being forgotten. He sings this song and he disappears. And then Hector explains pretty much the stakes of the world when you're forgotten we leave this world and we don't know where we go. Um, and so I sent that to Lee. I said, you don't have to read it. I just needed to get it out of my system. And he was actually very busy um, helping uh, uh, The Good Dinosaur uh, with some editorial stuff at that point. So he didn't respond for three weeks. And so I figured, <laughs> I, I figured, oh, either he read it and he didn't care for it, and that's fine, or he didn't read it and he probably won't, and I guess that's fine too. Uh, but ultimately, at the end of those three weeks, he he got around to it, and um, and he loved the scene, and and he said, um, do you have any other ideas that that you know in this realm you think would would make the film stronger? And I. I said, yeah, I've, I've, I've um, you know, I'm as in love with this film as you are, and and there's a few things that I'd be happy to run by you, and that kind of began the process towards writing an outline, um, as uh, uh, creating the s screenplay for that outline, and uh, and then the more we were in the room together, the more it developed into that uh, co-director relationship. So, so it went from outline to screenwriting to then co-director. Because, I mean, co-director is, mm -hmm. is something that doesn't always happen a lot for writers when they're adding new material. So mm -hmm. when did the co-director idea really solidify? It, it happened very soon after finishing that first draft of the script. And I think that was made... Um, I think that decision was made easier for Lee because of the fact that I had worked with him so much as a story artist. And because, like I said, a lot of the assignments that I would get were often unscripted. They would just be, these are the things we know we need to achieve. 
Um, do you do you have an example you want to give us? Maybe something from Toy Story 3? Yeah, for Toy Story 3, the very first, this was before Lee even knew me, I think it was more of a kind of a testing ground of, of what is the skill set you bring to the table, but the very first scene that I boarded on that film was, it wasn't scripted, the only criteria was, Woody needs to escape from the daycare, it needs to be something that is unrepeatable because later on in the story he breaks back in, but, but that avenue needs to be closed. And we want it to be funny. And so given that assignment, I, I, I just started writing little bullet points of what are all the places in a daycare and what are the funny uh, complications that could arise and, and what is something that, what are the, the, the props that you would see that could create a once one-time opportunity to escape, and and um, I didn't I didn't run the ideas past Lee. I wanted to surprise him in the boards, so I just boarded the scene where where uh, Woody hitches a ride on the janitor's cart. He sneaks into the bathroom, uh, uh, and he and he gets up to the roof and takes this kite and and hang glides out of the um, out of the the daycare. But uh, Lee and Darla remind me that the the moment that they knew that there was something special about letting me go off on my own is is I when Woody is in the bathroom stall, um, he needs to jump up onto the toilet seat and then uh, onto the toilet paper roll so that he can get up to a, a window. But before he gets to the toilet seat, he rips a little sheet of uh, toilet tissue and, and places it down. Um, <laughs> Because that's something that I would do if I'm in a bathroom <laughs> that I'm not familiar with, and, uh, and and I always try to to do something that that makes me laugh or or just feels specific enough that that it feels real, and um, so so that was the very first kind of introduction that we had to each other in terms of working together, and and um, so I think. Uh, because I had boarded a lot of scenes in, in, in the versions that we'd done before I had been writing, those were often the assignments that I would get is, is we need to introduce Hector um, uh, uh, and, and, and then you just start thinking, okay, what can I bring to this that is going to give you the solution you need? Um, and often I would try to do it in a way that would surprise him when I pitched it. Um, and and that allowed me to think through, these are the decisions that I would make visually, camera-wise, character, acting-wise. Um, and more often than not, when I pitched those, me and Lee would be in alignment about the decisions. Um, he, he had some really great course correction and, and navigation, but but generally we knew our filmmaking styles and, and, and our sensibilities were, were very much in alignment. Well, we're going to keep talking about the craft for a second here, and then we're going to get into like the spoiler section where we really talk about the, the hierarchy of the movie and, and the third act especially. But one of the things that's always fascinated me about Pixar is kind of what you were talking about a second ago, in which sometimes there's not a moment that's been scripted, but there's a feeling that the people at Pixar want to go for, and they're starting to build sets and props internally on, on the computers, and they want to see how they could be used. And I've always thought it's just really a strange way for a story to come together. What were some of the examples on Coco where there were scenes and sequences that you guys were kind of cracking that the script didn't really contain, or maybe the script wasn't even done, but the production, the production chain goes so long on these movies that they had right. to get cranking? Well... Uh, I mean, for the longest time, as, as Adrian mentioned, the, the, this was, we were developing this more as a, as a musical in the traditional Disney sense, and it was going to be like Pixar's first musical. And so there were, I mean, you know, Bobby and Kristen, the first song they wrote was Remember Me, um, and, but it was not the last song they wrote. I mean, there were lots of songs and lots of numbers and big big dance numbers and big, I mean, just, it, it, it got, it, it ran from the gamut from like, like huge Broadway show stopping things to just the weirdest, silliest. <laughs> the curse. Yeah, the, the, the curse of the singing river. river. Like, tell, like, tell us what that was. <laughs> there was. The early idea was that his family on the other side, um, because of the shenanigans, was cursed and they could only sing. And they hated it. <laughs> and everywhere they went, they're just like, music would just pipe in and they'd be like, 
and they couldn't talk without singing, and it drove them nuts. And um, and because this was the family that hated. This music. is the family that hated music, and 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 so so yeah, it got weird. <laughs> it got really weird because you're trying to see what works, and sometimes things that are that get you going in the room, and you finally execute them, you're like. Mm -hmm. Okay, it's I mean, like so. It's it, it basically the filmmaking process is is kind of like being in production development and post production all at the same time, right? It's it's sort of like if you were to make a movie only doing reshoots, <laughs> like it's just constant reshoots. You're like that didn't work. Let's let's shoot that again. Like we still have the location, so <laughs> let's let's shoot it again and see if it doesn't work maybe better this way. And so when you say like you when I work on a screenplay for three years. I lost count of how many versions there were. I mean, it just, it was, it, the, the iterative process was, was um, uh, it, it, it at times felt endless, but it always was poking at one thing, one very specific thing or another that felt and, right and or wrong. Sorry, what were you gonna say, AJ? Uh, just that in animation, um, yeah, the, the, to the point of endless reshoots, the way it works is that the story is still flexible until you start animating it. Even at that point, technically, it's still flexible, but it's much more expensive to make changes. But um, at, but different sequences go into production at different points. So you know, scenes that have worked for a long time. Some of these scenes have always been in even the first version, like when M Miguel breaks into the tomb. That scene has essentially stayed pretty much the same from from Matt's very first uh, draft of the film, and so. That that scene went into production um, very early on, and when that happens, it's like okay, so that's kind of locking. If we want to make changes that are that that scene affects, let's try to make those changes around that scene or later in the movie, or let's put this piece of information later. Um, if if it really needs to break that scene open again, you can, but that's kind of so your window of places to make your improvements starts to shrink, but but but. You know, it's all very flexible until that last frame is 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 uh, finaled. What year was it when you guys ditched the musical, and what was the the moment that broke the musical's back? Was it just one scene too many? Do you, do you remember the 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 discussion to truly veto the musical? Because it's just it's always wild to hear when yeah. something is scuttled because so many people get so attached to their ideas. But having an organic and fluid process the way you guys do at Pixar. I think kind of heightens the uh, the availability of new ideas to be born and, and proved upon. But in the early stages, you never th n you never think, well, that's locked because of what every everything Adrian just said. Everything is still, and it's it's one of the freeing things about writing there. But it's also one of the maddening things because you got to put something down. Everything can't be up for negotiation. You got to you have to make some firm decisions to start crafting a story. Um, and so, you know, it, it happened between the second and third screenings mm -hmm. of the film. The last draft I did was the first non-musical draft. Um, and by that point, you know, it, it, it wasn't like, I don't think there was a big, like, decision. It was just was like, it was plain it, from where I was sitting. It was like, I don't know if this is going to work. And, and we're watching Oh Brother, and we're like, boy, that really feels more like you know, like when the music is practical, and that felt more true to Mexican cinema, it felt more true to the story, it felt less like a, like we were grafting something onto, it just felt like we were grafting something onto something that, that didn't want it. And, um, and because y you're still sort of in pencil drawings at that point, um, you have the freedom to back up and sort of go back up the decision tree a few levels and change something major like yeah, that. Yeah, we, we've, we had versions of this film where Dante was in the first version and I oh think my the God. second version. So yeah, we, we, we had bigger fish to fry and so we just left Dante out of the second screening knowing that he was coming back. We just didn't want to physically track him. <laughs> We were, so it was you just, were just tracking his family in the other world? Yeah, he just didn't have a dog by his side always because we it, 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 it's a choreography issue and a time issue of like, who's going to draw the dog into every frame where the dog is even though the dog's not participating in the story. Mm -hmm. There was such 
an outcry. <laughs> like, you got rid of the dog. It's like, oh, yeah, the dog's back in, the dog's back in. <laughs> but those are, I mean, sometimes you need things that, that even at points seem obvious and necessary. Sometimes you need to go through the screening where you just take that out so that you know what you have and what you don't have. And, and I, I think we had done a, a couple of versions where it was all musical. And we knew that we loved the music. We knew that we loved Remember Me. We knew that it was necessary to the storytelling. But, but, uh, but every so often, you need to take a moment to say, like, as much as we love this, are we closing the door to something? Are we closing the door to an avenue that, that's going to get us what we really want? Um, and and that was one of those test test moments where where we said we still want it to be musical. We just what if it weren't a musical, and and that began to open up more time to develop the emotional story, to develop the um, a lot. You have to fit a lot of plot into this film because there's a lot of moving pieces, yeah. and to do that and also have seven full length songs that that was the big thing it was just the real estate mm -hmm. that well it's interesting you talk about that up. because you have a lot of things to set up you have the rules of the universe you have yes. the curse you have how to get back to the to the land of the living you, you have, have what is the holiday for right. people yeah. who have never heard of it and yeah. and you're setting up a lot even in the opening of the film because there's a long voiceover mm -hmm. that yes. is basically Miguel telling a story and it stops with the mariachi saying hey kid i wanted a shoe sign not your life which, story which, which is great by the way, that Pel Picado, Pe the Pel Picado sequence was drawn originally by Adrian, and it was um, it was a it was in the middle of the film, and it was part of a musical number. Mm -hmm. Really? Yeah. So, which is to say that that you know you can go down a certain avenue, and even though it, if it's not the thing that becomes the final decision, it's the thing that points to what became the final decision. So it allows the story to be modular because you could move something from the middle right back to the beginning, mm -hmm. and it will still serve the same function and stuff like that. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Well, but but it does it like it, it's one of those things. Like I remembered stories of Finding Nemo. It used to be that Marlin's story, uh, the the prologue, was parsed out over the the whole course of the film, and and people had a lot of trouble with his character because they didn't understand why he's so protective of his son and he's so adamant about and and people weren't getting on board with him and they moved that th those pieces of the story up to the prologue and you got it right off the bat and then and then that wasn't a problem anymore no one was questioning why he's being so protective of his one you know thing in this world and and you know we went through that experience yeah with many trying to parse out film. trying to parse that information and setting up and paying off is is always a trial and error and one of the things that I love about the final version of the film is that it sort of dares to go, okay, here's everything you need to know. <laughs> you know and it's like sometimes like you, you need a prologue that goes, here's everything you need to know. Okay, ready? Let's go. It's, and, it's, and it's like, it's great. <laughs> it, it's more exposition than I personally <laughs> care to put <laughs> right at the head of a film. Uh, but there are certain compromises that you make, and, and you hope that you can create, you depend on your, your story artists, you depend on, on all of the storytellers and animators to take that, those... Right, those you have to make it visual. That healthy stuff and make it visual and make it entertaining and, and, and keep you for long enough so that, so that when the story really gets going, you're caught up and, and you're ready for it. About your habit for a second, uh, obviously you guys both outline, when you write, how many hours a day do you write for, or do you give yourself a page count sometimes, just in your personal habit? Matt, starting with you. Um, God, um, I I try I, I I outline the the so like I said, it's an iterative process at Pixar. Um, the the I never outlined as much as I did <laughs> as until I worked at Pixar, um, and so they the, it, it is a bit of a boot camp, uh, an outline treatment pitch boot camp. Um, and so I, I use those skills a lot more now than I ever did before I started um, working over there. Um, but generally speaking, uh, I have a pretty good system. Um, I, I drop my kids off at school. I sit down and I go to work. I am solid until about 1 o'clock. And then I am done until about 3. And then 3.30, maybe I have a cookie. <laughs> like a chocolate chip cookie and um, and a cup of tea, and I get like another jump, and I can 
it, if I didn't have to stop and like, like, you, like go go home, <laughs> like I could I could go until about eight o'clock at night if I wanted to. If I if but but you know I, I, so for the three to five thirty, um, uh, I I kind of get carried. I lose track of time uh, in that time. I literally will be like, oh, it's four thirty. I should start packing up. Let me just finish this one thing. Oh, it's six. I gotta, you know, like I uh, it really happens that fast for me um, in the second half of the day. Um, so it's just a routine, whether it's, I, I, you know, I don't know how many pages, it would depress me to count pages. Uh, that just seems like I'm setting myself up to fail. I'm gonna write 10 pages today. I, that, would, that would paralyze me. It's good me. to have a routine, because then you're just getting through your day, you're clocking in, clocking out, yeah. and focusing as much as you can. It's gonna, there's only, when you're a, when you're a writer and, or, and, or a filmmaker or anything, um, there's only one day where you get to say, done. Like, there's only one day where you finally get to say, I am done. Every other day, it's like, oh, I still have that to do. I still have that other thing to write. Uh, we're not, uh, I haven't done the third act yet. i got to figure that out. Like, you're like, you always end the work day with more stuff that still needs to be done. And so you just kind of fall into that rhythm. Adrian, would, do you give yourself a page count? Or, or do you just go for a set number of hours? No, I do neither. <laughs> I Good. There's no uh, one way to do yeah, it. The, the reason why I like outlining is, is that I can break up a big task into lots of little tasks. And so if I've got an outline for all of the scenes that need to be written, and within those scenes, I always try to make a checklist of this is, this is the thing we need to do. If we could do these other things too, that would be great. Um, and then I, I take this. This feels like this feels like it's going to be a three-page scene. So I'll try to spend the morning working just on those three pages, going through trying to do all those things. Um, or this feels like it's going to be a, a six-page scene. So maybe this is going to take me all day. This looks like it's been a thorny scene. This is where all these things converge, and I've been having trouble with it. I'm going to give myself two days to try to navigate it and usually at the so I'll it's, mine is very task based um, and if I can check off the tasks or the scenes that I meant to do that day then that gives me peace deadline um, deadlines are really great and the, and I work backwards from deadlines um, uh, at Pixar we try to turn around the whole film every three months so if if I know if I know that um, I've got because and half of those three months, the story artists need to already have the pages to, <laughs> to yeah. be drawing. So I was like, okay, I've got three weeks to get through 21 scenes. Um, uh, so that means today I need to try to finish, you know, the first one, yeah. and then. I mean, like, uh, like I, I'm on a deadline right now, and I, I know how many hours I have left um, between now and the deadline. Like working hours, I'm like, okay. Uh, divide that by you know like like you just it, it, you end up working backwards just just for the podcast and and the folks in the room that aren't familiar you know you guys are talking about screening the film and how you're screening it eight or nine times right. it's it starts with an animatic which is basically still storyboards and a scratch voice track mm -hmm. often by people working at Pixar not the not the real actors of the final film and then just to see it just to watch it feel how it goes and then as your animation gets better and better and rougher and rougher, sometimes the actors are brought in and you basically screen the film every, as you're just saying, three months to see how it's doing, what could be improved on, and what could be cut on. Yeah. And you said you did it eight or nine times for, for Coco? Yes. Okay. And, 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 and is, and is that common, eight or nine, or is there a set number for any of these? That's pretty common. Yeah, uh, it, it, it's not that... It, it gets faster the further it goes. Yeah. Like in the beginning, it's not a three month turnaround. No, um, it's just it's impossible to do that in the beginning. But but as it accelerates, because as you were saying, more gets locked, so less is able to change, and so there's there's less to actually iterate. Last question before like kind of the big spoilers. Um, just deciding how much to have in English and, and Spanish. I mean, Mama Emilda's song in the end like is completely in Spanish, mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. there's there's going back and forth a lot was were there any rules you guys were trying to follow were was there ever it leaning one way more than the other that you you revised um it, it was it was a constant process one of the the elements that really helped to to push us to get as much spanish as possible in there was our uh, group of cultural consultants every every they were there for every screening and and every time um, they'd say, we love the Spanish, but you know, you can put in more, you can put in more. And so um, we had to create a, a logic to 
when we could do it, how we could do it, so that it um, no nobody got lost. If you didn't speak Spanish, you would uh, it would add to the experience rather than take away from the, from the storytelling experience. And so the things we did where they were cognates of, of, of English words, so like family and familia, fantastic and fantastical, those were very easy um, to put in. When they were common Spanish phrases like uh, muchas gracias, uh, por favor, hola, those were easy. Um, and then where Maybe you don't understand what the words mean, but when through the character's actions, they convey that meaning, they give that context. So when um, Miguel's abuelita finds him in the plaza shining the mariachi shoes and she dresses the mariachi down and she goes to her grandson and we want to show her cooing over him. So she says, ay mi querido cielito, angelito. And she's hugging him to her bosom and, and you don't need to know what those words mean, but, but you'll get from the, the acting that, that she, you know, he's her little angel and, and no he wrong. can do no wrong. I, I would honestly recommend anybody uh, to, to see this movie in Spanish. Um, it's it, it, all of what Adrian is saying in terms of the enrichment of it. It's that much more. Um, I, uh, uh, I saw it with my wife, who does not speak Spanish. She had seen the movie once before. She followed the whole thing for that very reason, because you don't. The acting is so good, and um, that you don't need to, you, can, you, you get it. And it's r just a really rich experience just to watch the whole thing in Spanish. All right, we're going to get to our spoilers. For the folks at home in the podcast, press pause if you haven't seen it. And if you haven't seen it, I don't know why you haven't seen it. Fix that. But, uh, you know, just, just getting in right off the bat, it was really interesting, a little trick that you guys did in the first act in which you're, you're, you're creating a mystery. And the mystery answer seems to be that Ernesto is his great-grandfather. And it's, it's great. But then later on in the movie, we learn that actually that's a lie and that he murdered Hector. It's a misunderstanding. It's a misunderstanding, yeah. Not yeah. a lie. Not a, not he a lie. He jumped to a conclusion, yes, like all yes. children do. But but so I'm curious at one point that that, that entered the, the phase of, of being able right to... Right in the beginning, yeah, right in the okay. beginning. Okay. Yeah, that was always the idea, uh, that that uh, he, that the, the process of going back to the land of the dead and meeting your ancestors would uncover some sort of family secret uh, that would right a wrong in the wrong. The original sin of the movie is 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 Imelda saying we are not going to remember that man. You know that, well, or it could be Hector walking away from his family. Well, he, he, <laughs> you know, I cut him some slack. I don't know. Like this is this. These are the these are the discussions we have for years. <laughs> like, oh no, is it? Um, but I mean, the the thing that needs to be corrected, the things that that can and should be corrected, which is which is the the photo on the ofrenda, mm -hmm. um, and and so the idea that there is a photo on the ofrenda with a face ripped out was from the very beginning, and it was just like, okay, how do we? pull off the misdirect. Sometimes the photo unfolded and then you saw the man without a face. Sometimes it was the face and it unfolded and then it was just the guitar. Like, like you mo we modulated a hundred different ways on how that mystery revealed itself, um, but we always sort of knew that, um, we always knew that, that, that there when we went down to Mexico and, and there, was, there was this one dog that was sniffing around one of the ofrendas and trying to eat the food. And I was like ribbing Lee and showing him this. And we were like, that's how they break the photo. Like, it's got to be the dog. Like, like, we were still making a case for having a dog in the movie. Um, so yeah, like stuff like that, those big temple. Luckily, those things got battened down on the story, and we could just write around that. What about the complications of figuring out exactly how the, the magical entry to and from the living world works. You know, the, the, the concept of the curse. You steal a guitar, mm -hmm. and you are... It always felt bad to, like, break into a tomb on any night, but especially this night, to break into a tomb and steal something when you're supposed to be giving stuff to the... Like, it all... It, it, I remember, Were I think it was Andrew... you played with? Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, Andrew Stanton was the one who was saying from the very beginning... Um, that whatever he does to get zapped into the other world, it's got to feel like really wrong. Like it's just got to feel like he should not be doing that. Um, and uh, so whatever that has to be. And so um, uh, uh, yeah, it felt like breaking the window on a tomb and going in and stealing a prized artifact. 
felt. How, however good your intentions. Yeah, but then it was like, how do we? How are we still on this then side? Then you got to modulate. Yeah. Whether you're still on board with with Miguel. Um, yeah. No. This this is a film full of rules, and and um, they they morphed and they changed throughout uh, the course of the making. It and it was all in an effort to do what we needed to do to serve Miguel's story. But like some of it. Um, it took some time to find. There are versions of the story, uh, the mechanism by which he gets back home yeah. changed almost every screening at, at the beginning. It, it what were some of the ideas you played with? It was once that he strummed this guitar that sent him into the land of the dead and he needed to return it to the rightful owner. Oh, right, right. right. Um, uh, and that person needed to strum him back. Yeah. There um, was a version where the gu- he strummed the guitar and it vanished, and he had to find the guitar to strum it again to get back. That but, was but so version. it's interesting because your progression is that it was focusing too much on an object, not on an emotional, personal yes. beat. So that's what it evolved to, basically. Yeah, one of the one of the big breakthroughs in terms of Miguel's story was was, and again, it's another rule, but but it, it turns out to be something that's very helpful is this idea of him needing his family's blessing, and that being that that. The stealing from the dead is the curse that sends him there, but receiving the blessing is is uh, from his family is the thing that puts yeah. everything right. Um, uh, the reason why that was so helpful was because we had this wonderful first act where if Miguel could have gotten a blessing from his family, the permission to do the thing that he feels like he's meant to do, then the story is solved. But when you set up that in the first act and you get to the second act and now it's about finding the rightful owner of a thing, um, the alignment isn't quite in alignment. And being able to say you need a blessing from someone in your family all of a sudden took the first act conflict and the second act conflict and it became a continuation of something we spent a lot of time setting up. Yeah, one of the biggest lessons I learned just as a writer working on Coco and also on the other film that, that I've been working on there is that that the it it can't just be physically challenging in the middle of the film for your hero. It has to be emotionally challenging. Like there has to be something about the journey, the quest, whatever that is going to make them really uncomfortable. And we were always like, "Oh, this is like the ultimate family reunion. Like you you you're you're you are stuck with your family whether you like them or not you know and we knew that there was an emotional challenge built into that um but uh so often when you're doing these movies where it's like world building and you know you got to get from here to there by a certain by the stroke of midnight or whatever um your first instinct is okay what obstacles do we need to build like what bridge does he have to cross what street does he have to run through what test does he have to you know, this 10 trials of Hercules or whatever, like, like you, you start going into that mode. Um, and one of the things that I learned was, was all the obstacles have to be relational. Like it has to just be a, an obstacle in the relationship. You have to get something from somebody who doesn't want to give it to you um, because they want something else for you, you know? And so that when, uh, you know, the conditions that Imelda puts on the blessing and how those eventually get stripped away to no conditions is what I think is one of the more elegant things that that um, that it, it, when I left there were still a lot of problems on the table when I when I saw subsequent versions I was like oh that's so good <laughs> like that it must oh, be weird man. to like come back to it like you know within months later and see how the problems that you were banging your head against the wall it was more of a relief for me sure. personally I was like oh yes it's they got it they figured that part out great okay and what you know and, and I it, I just I got really excited. You know, I can't imagine this film any other way, but, yeah. but was it ever not called Coco? Because if you really think about it, Coco is a character that is not in the movie that much. She she becomes But then the, she's the, everything. Yes, yes, she is the heart of the movie. So it's interesting, but was that the first blueprint? There, we had thought of maybe calling the film Remember Me. Um, that felt like it was a very appropriate, applicable kind of... Um, thing that that sounded good as a movie title um but there's something about the m- one the mystery of the name and you don't even know it's a name coco um before you've seen this film that it kind of allowed uh, allowed this story to just kind of exist in its own space and create its own 
I mean, even just seeing those letters in, in those colors across it's, the screen. It's more fun to say. Like, yeah. remember me is kind of lugubrious. Like, like you're like, oh, that's going to be heavy. But yeah. you're like, Coco, <laughs> like, that'll be fun. It's, yeah. it's got a dog. Right? <laughs> like, you, know, um, you know, and then you're like, oh, you know, like, you know, so, yeah, that it, it's a title that sneaks up on you, I think, in the way this, that the movie yeah. sneaks up on you. I, I'm curious, you know, as we talk about the spirit animals for a second, just yeah. was, was Frida's spirit animal... Was that supposed to maybe be a trope to the to the monkey from Raiders of the Lost Ark? Because that little monkey. <laughs> you have to ask Jason Katz about that. Yeah. All right, because that monkey reminded me. But I, I thought it was interesting in which Mama Emilda had Pepita. Yes. And it's a fierce, huge spirit animal that is able to save them from, you know, Miguel and Hector from the pit that only Bane could have crawled out of. Uh, right, right, right. Scaled the wall. But 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 what's interesting is that Ernesto has these little tiny dogs. <laughs> little, like, like, and, and, I'm, and I was curious if you ever were going to have Ernesto have some fierce spirit animals as well. I don't that think that ever came no, up. No, no. no. It's just interesting that she has this like co complete beast, I mean, and it, he doesn't. I, I, thinking about it now, I, maybe it was subconscious, but, but you know, I feel like the, the guides who are there to help the characters are a reflection of those characters. And with yeah. Imelda... I think she, yeah. she's, like, a, <laughs> she's a force to be reckoned she's with. She's a badass. Yeah. She, she is a force to be reckoned with, and, and you know she draws a lot of strength in, in the pursuit of protecting her family. For Ernesto de la Cruz, I think it's absolutely appropriate that he's got these you know tiny little display dogs. They're not even, they don't even have a point. They're just, they're just pretty to look at. So that he has no moral compass and there's no one there to guide no, him? I, I think None. so. Yeah, yeah. I think that's, that's, pr that's a reflection of, of, of who he is. Uh, and, and one of those things, it works for that movie star persona. It also kind of works for that, you know, brooding, evil, uh, 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 self-interested guy. Um, so I think I think that might have been subconsciously what informed those decisions. On that on that same path, you know, Dante dying, uh, you know, and becoming a spirit animal, kind of reinforcing. I might need to make a clarification. I don't think he died at all. <laughs> that was that was my interpretation that yeah. he died. Well, and no, I can't control your interpretation. No, the uh, the the <laughs> the alouriges uh, of the world have uh, free passage back and forth. Okay. So you you'll you'll see uh, at the end uh, Dante and Pepita come back to the living world as a living dog and a living cat. I thought um, there was like a splinter, like two versions of them. No, I always, I always thought of it as like Clarence getting his wings, you know, like, okay, okay. like that was, I think, for me anyway. That's what, that's what the Dante of it all always, always. We, we knew the, these. Like, again, it was through the research we discovered this, you know, we learned about this breed of dog and how ancient it is, and 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 the. Um, Sort of the folklore around them, and we're then we're like, okay, well, they're in the movie. Um, they're goofy, and let's see how goofy we can do it. And and wouldn't it be great if this could be our our Clarence? You know, was it was it part of also showing the threat possibility though to to kind of remind us that Miguel was turning to bone, kind of like in a Back to the Future, I'm fading away type of way. It, it, that yeah, that became the most useful ticking clock, and and yeah. we, we again lots of ticking clocks. Uh, we had yeah. lots of ticking clocks. Um, uh, we we actually modeled some literal marigold clocks that you see in the film on a couple of occasions. We don't use them for that purpose, but we had them <laughs> in the in the mm -hmm. back pocket just in case. Um, but but that that was something that didn't come until probably halfway through our screening cycles. It was always an idea that was on the shelf of like, wouldn't it be great if he was slowly turning into bone but then it was like oh how, how do uh, it was okay. hard to draw it was hard to draw it was hard to conceive it was hard to it it, it it posed a lot of challenges and it was like okay well just let's put it back on the shelf and we'll worry about this today you know and then that so you know that was another one of those things where i was i was glad to see it finally get realized in the way that it did yeah there was one screening where we decided well we've been talking about it all this time why don't we just try it for one screening and see what it does and it definitely gave us the most visceral and the most present um ticking clock uh it was the least convoluted and uh, and it actually helped to solve a lot of um problems when he's in the land of the dead that once his hands turn skeletal you're like okay i buy that people would think he's a skeleton <laughs> we're, we're and, and i buy that he needs to get out and i buy that he needs that to was get the out. right because it's so fun you're like well you should stay 
you know, but it, it's like, no, you don't want him to stay. We're, that starting, is, yeah, the, we're starting to run out of time, and I want to get it, two questions before we get at least one from the crowd, just really quick. You know, I was, this is as surreal as can be. I was literally at a funeral this morning for a friend of mine's parent, okay. and it was, it, was, it was really interesting, again, to see the, the honor of memory in this movie, because, you know, everybody was talking about the, the fun times at, at, at the funeral and cracking everybody up, pretty much. But I'm curious what you could tell us about the construction of the final remember me scene with Coco when she kind of comes back to life and the song yeah. brings her back to life and just some of the challenges that you had creating that. I, when I first, like, like we said, like that was, we knew that was gonna be the ending from the very beginning. Um, in, the, in the first few months of brainstorming the new story, we found ourselves discussing memory. We found ourselves discussing music and seeing how that how closely they were linked that these that songs are are time capsules they're messages in the bottle from from long ago and um, especially recorded songs um, and um, and and so we knew that and I just remember it was like well what if what if there was somebody in his family who was who was losing her memory and what if she couldn't even remember the people around her and what if he could help that. Right, and so that became like, yeah, that would be great. And so, scripting that for the first time was one of the easier things that I did on the movie. Honestly, that was, I, I think, it just was always the thing. And I, I knew that in that first draft I was writing to, uh, I think the only note I got ever on that scene from Lee was, um, slow it down. Like, just get, just at this, he was like, just give this another breath, add another line, add another almost and and then Jason boarded it and it took us it took our breath away and it didn't change much it, it ever for the next five years um, Adrian was there something you remember about that scene or was it, was um, it really just kind of a, an early lock it, no it, it definitely was I've, I've gone back since to read the very first script uh, yeah. pages and and I th we did a tiny little bit of back and forth between Miguel and Mama Coco after after the song is done. There's like one or two lines that we added to it, but it is word for word. Um, I think one of the things that got added maybe in a subsequent draft was that she had the photo. I think that was, no, that, that was, was in, in there? The, the first verse. I mean, yeah, it, it was like, that was it, North. That yeah, scene it, was North. It, 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 that from the very first screening, everyone at the studio, you know, saw that scene, was touched by it. And I think we always knew, like, if we're ever in a position where we're rethinking this scene, then we've <laughs> lost. Gone too far. <laughs> yeah, we've gone too yeah. far. Well, it's interesting, though, because some fans have wondered since, you know, you, you've, you've played out the rules and Hector has faded that was there ever any scene that you guys had in a planning stage that never made it to the final film of showing Hector revived as they're singing the song? Because you, you leave it for the I audience never, to never, do the math, which we, works. We, it, it had been discussed, be, as you're trying to explore every option, it had been discussed in this room of like, oh, do we want to cut away to the land of the dead? Do we want to see the... Uh, and we just found that um, you didn't need it. It didn't add anything to that moment. Um, uh, and, and really at that point, almost two hours in, if the audience can't go that distance, <laughs> yeah. you fail. Exactly, exactly. If they're, if they're not yeah, projecting, if they're not seeing, if they're not feeling in their heart what Miguel is feeling when he puts that photo together and he sees that, that yeah. this stuff. And for me, like those are, those are the, s the stakes for the characters, but but the stakes for Miguel for the universe are if this is a world where a daughter forgets her father and that's the end of it, um, like that's the heartbreaking thing. And so I think for him, it's not even so much, it is, but it's not even so much about saving Hector or making sure that Hector survives as it is honoring his wish to let his daughter know that he loved yeah. her. And when that happens, I don't think you need the, you, you project all the extra stuff. The only other thing I would add to all of this, just to, for everybody's knowledge, is that that song, um, the, 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 the order we gave, <laughs> the order we put in with Bobby and Kristen, uh, who, who most people know from, from their work on Frozen, um, was we need a song, <laughs> we need it to be simple, we need it to be sung three different ways, we need it to be um, 
like fast and braggadocious. We need it to be melancholy, uh, sung to a, a, a girl you don't see anymore. And then we need a little boy to sing it. Also, and don't change the lyrics. Or and the none of the lyrics can change. <laughs> And and uh, uh, and make it catchy. Oh, and it has to sound like it, it was written in Mexico in uh, the 1920s. And so, it, so it was easy for them. And then they came back. I mean, th they came back with like like remember me two ways with Bobby singing the temp as it, with an acoustic and with a full arrangement on his synth. And it was like. It was like, oh, uh, okay, <laughs> like, check, check. <laughs> like, okay, we have our ending. Like, like, so it, w it, w there was, the, the, I, I, th I, I, I think that on this film, even though it's not a musical, I think it has more um, um, uh, synchronicity, more interplay between story and song than most movies made I nowadays. Um, uh, and so I just want to give them the credit for writing that song kind of in a vacuum. Anyway, last question before one for the crowd. What was your toughest scene for each of you, and how did you creatively break through the challenge? So, Adrian, as, as, as a writer and or as a director, what was your toughest scene, the one that you were sweating, the one you were coming back to again and again, and how did you creatively break through? Uh, uh, the toughest scene is probably one of the ones that, uh, it's always the ones where you, <laughs> you need to fit a bunch of exposition and there's not a lot to care about. <laughs> Um, and, and so the, the, even though it was the toughest, probably not my favorite. My favorite scenes are the ones where everything comes together and <laughs> Mama Melda is singing on stage and all of that. The toughest one was probably um, Abuelita introducing the ofrenda and the ideas of d pretty much laying out the rules of the Day of the Dead because logically this kid has been raised no he knows this all of this tradition. Stuff. He yeah. knows all of this stuff. Right. So why would she be telling? Why him? would she be telling it to him? Um, and and so creating a, a scenario where where she is communicating these traditions and it doesn't feel like exposition was took many. That's probably th that one and and the scene where where the parents kind of put the the apron on him. Those two were the ones that that just kept on having to be revised to try to hit. That middle spot where where you're you're getting what you need, but you're not slowing down the story too much. And uh, no joke, like the exact same scene. Really? That's your, that's your same before, scene. Before, when you asked that question, I was like, oh, easy, the Afrenda scene. It was the hardest. I wrote that a thousand times. It just it it that is exactly what you say. You are writing a scene of exposition where a, a character is trying to talk to your hero about something that you need the audience to know. The main character, the hero already knows it, doesn't want to hear it again, and is trying to leave the room. <laughs> it's not going to stick in the audience's mind if the hero doesn't want to hear it. And so how do you, how do, you do that? I, I, like, uh, that was absolutely the hardest scene to write. We're going to go for one question from the crowd. I'm going to go, first hand I saw right up there, right up in the back, yep. With so many skeletons, what do you do to try and design-wise make this more kid-friendly? Even though we do have the history of Nightmare Before Christmas and stuff like that, obviously you didn't want kids or families to think that this was a scary or horror-based movie because it's it's really a warm movie. So what were some of the things that you did to, to kind of self-edit, or did you? One of the things that, that made it a lot easier to hit the tone we were trying to hit was the fact that Dia de Muertos in Mexico is a celebratory, um, you know, festival. Uh, 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 and, and so we knew that, that, you know, in the whole history of, of skeletons in cinema, usually they are spooky, they are morbid, they're meant to, to uh, signal foreboding and danger. So we had to make, we talked in the room uh, uh, about design-wise, how do we take skeletons and turn them into family members. Well, um, they, they need to be able to emote, they need to be able to express, and that comes from eyes. So even though it's, it's a little bit of a, of a um, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? 
cheat or, 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 or liberty that we're taking. We, we give them eyes, we want to, we give them kind of bony lips because if, if you're looking at like this through the entire, like the... the um, like dental school. Dental school, yeah. th that's gonna prevent you from caring when Hector is pouring his heart out, you know, in, in, the, in the sinkhole. Um, so we, we just gave it to a lot of artists. We did a lot of drawings and, and, and as we started to get to those moments where people were emoting, we, we, um, we knew that it was in the eyes. It was in the, the actor's performance and just whatever we could do to, to design them delicately. Still have the physicality of skeletons and still have that bony quality, but, but that the emotion needed to be delicate and that's eyes, that's eyebrows, that's lips, that's what you express in your face. Well, I love this movie. You guys have been very generous with your time and I cannot wait to see what you do next. Give it up for Adrian and Matt. Thanks so much. Thank you. Thanks.